الحمد لله حق حمده والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد خاتم أنبيائه وإمام رسله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم فقهنا في الدين وعلمنا التأويل وإلهمنا بفيض فضلك رشدنا يا رب العالمين الحمد لله In our lessons on Imam Al-Birgivi's work At-Tariqa Al-Muhammadiyya we have begun looking at the sins of the tongue, which is the second of the pathways of taqwa. The central pathway of taqwa in the human being is our heart. The second is the tongue. And as we saw in the first two lessons when we looked at the importance of restraining one's tongue, we saw that Faith is dependent on being true. And being true, Sidq, is dependent upon being truthful in speech. So speech is related to both having a state pleasing to Allah, which can be summarized in Sidq, and in faith itself, which is the key of salvation and eternal rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> and we explored that and its <coughs> related meanings in the first two lessons. So today, ta'ala, we move on to the next section, which is on afatul lisan, right? The the harmful traits of speech. And Imam al-Birgavi tells us that these are 60. And today we're going to look at the first of these. Starting with disbelief and errors related to disbelief, so to, to words that could imply or entail disbelief, without falling into misgivings, as we'll see. And that's an important clarification and of the benefits of studying something. Sometimes people read things and they read wrong things into them. That if you say something that could entail this belief, it could make you a disbeliever. It could, but when does it? So instead of remaining in confusion and acting on confusion, the cure is to ask, to find out, because there's no merit in caution based on knowledge. Right? Caution without knowledge is just confusion. So that is an important thing to be very clear about. So we look at Disbelief, errors, and lying. So the first of these issues is statements of disbelief. So the author, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him, tells us that there are 60 blameworthy traits related to speech. The first of these, al-awwal kalimatul kufr, is a statement of disbelief. Before we see what the author has to say, there are a couple of things to be clear about. To appreciate what is what are statements of disbelief, firstly we have to understand what is belief itself. What is Iman? And Iman is, as the author of Juhurat al-Tawheed, Imam al-Laqani says, وَفُسِّرَ الْإِيمَانُ بِالتَّصْدِيقِ Iman, belief, is to confirm as true what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has come with. That is Iman. Right? Iman is confirming the truth that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, has come with. And in that regards, you either believe or you don't. So that's Iman. To confirm is true what the Messenger of Allah وسلم, has come with. That you believe in Allah you believe in Allah and His Messenger and the and in general in, in the truth of what the Messenger of Allah وسلم, has come with in general. So if that's belief, what is disbelief? Kufr, it's kufr is the negation of belief. It is non-belief. And the details of that we looked at earlier when in the Tariq al muhammadiyah much earlier when we covered the section on beliefs. In that section, we looked at what we can call al-haddul fasil, the Parameter, the differentiating parameter between 
Iman and Kufr. So disbelief is denying Allah or denying the Messenger وسلم, or denying things that are necessarily known to be of the religion. The simple test of it is, you know, so that you don't get doubts is if the person who thinks, maybe I committed kufr. That's a simple question. Do you believe? Yes. And it goes back to one question. Do you believe in the truth of the Messenger وسلم, came with? We say, well, I do. But, no, there's no but. You either believe or you don't. And the believer believes. Doubts about whether you believe are confusion. So you don't entertain confusion, but you get out of it through clarity. Right? If someone steps on something brown and sticky, you don't just remain standing there wondering, is that dog feces? You step away and get rid of the, the problem. Do you have to actually smell it and taste it? Of course not. You just move on. Right? Because you don't remain mired in the problem. Just get out of it. So that's an important point. And um, fa the author, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, tells us regarding this. And what, what page are, are do you have the hmm? okay so he says rahimahullah ta'ala al awwal kalimatul kufr the first is a statement of disbelief and he says wal iyadu billahi ta'ala and we seek refuge in allah mighty and majestic and this is from the norms of the believer that any time something evil is mentioned, we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from it. وَالْعِيَذُ بِاللَّهِ Our refuge is in Allah most high. So he tells us, right? So he tells us regarding statements of disbelief. And here we also have to be careful that some of what is mentioned is there's some things that are outright disbelief and there's other things that would entail kufr. And there sometimes the scholars say such and such thing is kufr. It does not mean that it is itself kufr, but it entails kufr. So you don't deem yourself a kafir like that. It may be sinful as we will see. So if someone says for example, well I'm, if that's the case I'm a Christian. Imam say, you don't joke about your religion. But saying I'm a Christian, who is Christ? Sayyidina Isa. Is a Muslim a follower of Sayyidina Isa? Yes. Right? But, so that is not in itself. Are you denying belief in Allah? No. Are you denying belief in the Messenger? No. Are you denying the truth of what he's come with? No. You're not saying, I accept the Trinity and this and this. No. So those are words that entail disbelief. So the, the ulama, when they tell us that such and such thing is kufr because it would entail kufr. Because if you said, I'm a, if someone said, I'm a Christian, then if you actually meant it exactly, that would entail affirming the divinity of Christ, the affirmation of Trinity, the denial of the, the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, etc. And those matters would be itself kufr. So there's a differentiation between what the ulama mentioned as kufr and what makes somebody a kafir. So you can't auto-fatwa yourself in that sense. And the shaitan, of course, likes joking, likes messing with people about that. So don't. Right? Don't accept the misgivings of shaitan. We take statements of kufr very seriously. Don't do it. Don't joke about your iman. It's the most precious thing that you have. Your faith, your faith, as has come. Right? It's the greatest thing that you have been gifted with. So you don't joke about it. You wouldn't joke about what your parents do every day in the washroom. Why? Because it's not proper manners. Presumably, no one's parents don't go to the washroom at all. 
Right? It's almost inconceivable. But when we don't talk about those things, obviously, unless there's some reason, you know, someone's parents need medical attention, you talk to the doctor about a matter or something, but that's an exception. So similarly about things like this. This is the, the utmost of gravity, so we take it very seriously. Now there is a definition then of, yeah, so kufr is denial of the truth that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, has come with, either about Allah or His Messenger or the, the teachings of our religion, of the things that are necessarily known to be of the religion. So he says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, that وَحُكْمُهُ إِنْ كَانَ نَوْعًا إِنْ كَانَ طَوْعًا مِنْ غَيْرِ سَبْقِ لِسَانٍ If one says a statement of disbelief willingly, without slip of the tongue, that it would annul all one's actions. If one does it willingly, without a slip of the tongue. Now someone is saying ludicrous things. They say, if that's true, then I'm Christian too. Just blurt it out, didn't think. Now that's Reckless speech, one makes tawbah, istighfar, but you didn't say it willingly, it was a slip of the tongue, does not make you a kafir. But someone actually disbelieved, it annuls one's actions. ثُمَّ لَا يَعُودُ بَعْدَ التَّوْبَةِ And then one's past works do not return after tawbah. In of itself. Unless the tawbah. You know, unless Allah otherwise wills. Right? Because of the hadiths related to that. Someone commits disbelief and then they re-enter the faith. Their past works are annulled. So it's a very serious matter. And why? So that people don't take iman lightly or the gift of iman lightly. فَيَجِبُ عَلِيهِ الْحَجُّ إِنْ كَانَ غَنِيَّ So therefore, one would have to do Hajj again if one has the financial means. However, one does not have to repeat what one has prayed, fasted, or given in zakat. However, any if someone committed disbelief and one missed prayers or fasts or zakat during that period, one has to make qada of it. And if one had that, the best thing to do is to consult a reliable scholar, reliable learned scholar, about how to go about addressing that. وَلَا مَعْصِيَةَ عَفْوًا وَالْمَعْصِيَةُ لَا تَذْهَبُ بِالْكُفْرِ because sins are not lifted by disbelief. And leaving obligations are from sin. So this is outright disbelief. Many people, and this is not just a new thing, throughout time have struggled with faith. The simple question is, do you believe? Yes or no? Yes. Allah. So the if someone believes, but then they have some question marks. They have some question marks. But they believe. Belief is not a spectrum. You believe or you don't. And if you're a Muslim, you believe. Simple. Then someone has questions. Most of the questions are minor and ciliary confusions. I'm not sure exactly why I believe. Okay. Do you know exactly how your car works? But do you drive it? Yes, because it works, hopefully. Right. Do you know exactly how the cake was made? No, but you eat it. Right. We, do you have any doubt that the cake exists? No. Right. So many things we don't know exactly. So the confusion is not, not about the thing itself, but about details. So 
anytime one has a confusion, what does one do? One asks. We're not talking about here about Iman or Kufr. We're talking about here about statements of, of belief and disbelief. They are, it's something you're careful. We only speak about Allah and his messenger and the religion with respect. With and, and propriety, adab and ta'zim. And avoid all else. And even if grumpy, disgruntled, angry, we don't bring the religion into, we don't bring Allah, his messenger, or anything of sanctity into it. And you're arguing with someone, say, well, that's what you say then? And they say something about their relationship with belief. We don't. We do not do that. If one fell into something like that, this is of the gravest of matters. It is more urgent than seeking surgery for a palpitating heart or if you think you had a stroke. Because if you were to die a believer, you're okay. But if you're to die a disbeliever, you're not. So immediately what you do, if you don't know... Is what is the question status of this? What would you do? you know if you are wondering if your heart's okay? You'd go to emergency. You seek emergency assistance. Immediately contact a reliable scholar or trustworthy friend. Even and say I'm having this confusion. What do I do? In the meantime, one should say I accept. Amen to Billahi. I believe in Allah. I say you repeat your shahada out of certitude because you know. لا you say أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا رسول الله. I bear witness that you know, and you make the statement of belief not because you could have committed kufr but so that you dispel any doubt. You say لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Tell us that's it. If any nagging confusion arises, you go and you consult. If you said something, unless it's outright kufr, it's likely a technicality. Our Lord is merciful and won't put you in hell over a technicality. If you did something inappropriate, you apologize. Right? If you had particular trouble with the washroom and your respected uncle came out and said, Uncle, how was it in the washroom? How was, how was it at the toilet? He gives you this look like, you rascal. You say, I, I'm really sorry. Okay? Even though, was it a sinful thing? No, just inappropriate. You're not going to be excommunicated from your family, etc. So Allah is infinitely more merciful than that. He won't, you know, He won't excommunicate you on a technicality, but you take the means of rectifying in, in the manner mentioned. There are other consequences for actual disbelief. For actual disbelief, such as he says. When Fisakh and Nikah Walaw Minal Marati Bila Talaq actual statements of disbelief make in uh, annul one's marriage because a Muslim ma a Muslim someone who commits disbelief becomes a murtad, they become an apostate, an apo and a Muslim man cannot be married to an apostate woman. And a Muslim woman cannot be married to an apostate man. So it annuls the marriage without requirement of talaq. فَلَا يَلْزَمْ ال... What do you have? فَلَا يَلْزَمْ الْحِلَّةُ بَعْدَ يعني بَعْدَ الثلاث. So then that does not require tahleel. One does not require, in this case, like for example, if they'd already divorced before and then the husband, for example, disbelieved. But then he came back to Islam. The, the annulment of the marriage does not count as a, as a talaq. So for them to remarry, she wouldn't have to marry another person first. So there's a wisdom that, as we know, in the event of Three talaqs, then the the couple cannot get, get back together until she marries somebody else. And the wisdom of that is that people don't take talaq lightly. Because it has grave consequences, not only for the two of them, but for children and others. It's meant to be a deterrent against 
casual or hasty or angry pronouncements of divorce. But if but if someone does commit disbelief, you know, does leave Islam, which, this is of the rulings. So then he says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, فَلَوْ صَدَرَتْ مِنَ الْمَرْأَةِ تُجْبَرُ عَلَى النِّكَاحِ زَجْرًا لَهَا بَعْدَ التَّوْبَةِ ومن الرجل تخير المرأة انتاب. So now this will used to be a fatwa, right? Because, and this does not necessarily apply in our times, that if the woman committed apostasy, she is forced to remarry, forced to remarry her husband. And this was because in some places, if well, it became a habit, that women, if they, got, they heard that in order to get out of marriage, all you have to do is... Declare you're not Muslim. So the fuqaha said, Auntie, you can't do that. You have to get back with uncle. For obvious reasons. Right? And people do what they do. And this was a real problem. And there's some uh, corrupt ulama who did this. You know, wealthy ladies and a lot of wealth of the world is in, in the hands of aunties. You know, her husband died. She inherited the wealth and so on. Uncle spent the money. She saved it. Anyways, so she wants to get out. Simple way. She heard. She commits apostasy just by words. Marriage is annulled. She's out of the marriage. And then she, I'm Muslim. So I said, no, you got to get back. But now that's a fatwa issue. And that's a fatwa issue. Right? If it's just made a statement of kufr, the fuqaha would say in court that would be considered that you know it's like a claim that's against reality but the man since he can he can pronounce divorce if he does it then he is not forced to return to the marriage but the woman has the choice she doesn't have to remarry the husband so zubair and zubaydah were married zubair committed kufr he became Christian for six months. Marriage got annulled right at the beginning. Now, six months later, he says, I'm Muslim. Zubaydah, you got to get back with me. It's up to Zubaydah if she wants to remarry Zubair or not. She has the choice if he repents. What's the repentance from Kufr? What's the repentance from Kufr? It is to enter back into Islam. So that's the those are some of the legal rulings. But these apply in actual case. Someone commits actual kufr. Doubts about kufr are waswasa from the shaitan. We have to be exceedingly clear about that. You have to ignore them, seek refuge in the shaitan from them. Affirm your faith. Say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah. If doubts persist, that is like having the signs of a heart attack. Go talk to a scholar. But make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of times these things arise through harmful social isolation. Okay? Through weakening of religious practice. Through engaging in sinful activities, etc. So that it creates a spiritual um, um, dissonance that is expressed in things like this. So yeah, sometimes you have to realize that, you know, I shouldn't be doing that. I shouldn't be doing foolish things. Um, so then he says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, From the rulings of disbelief is hurmatu zabihatihi. From the rulings of kufr is that the zabiha, the animal slaughtered by a person who's left the deen, is not permitted to eat. So let's say Uncle Bilal has become Bill. 
He's now considered an apostate. We can't eat Uncle Bilal's meat. Right? وَحِلُّ قَتْلِهِ Right? And that, it becomes, you know, by court order, that they could be liable to the punishment related to an apostate. وَالْإِجْبَارَ عَلَى التَّوْبَةِ And that they can be forced by the Qadi to repent. Because right? sometimes people do foolish things. One of the simple ways to avoid public confusion is they say, look, Uncle Jamil, you have to repent. Right? You're causing a lot of commotion. It's a very practical thing. That you know, Uncle Jamil thought, you know, it would be cool if I became Christian. So Qadi might say, look, Jamil Mia, please repent and leave your folly. And of course, by advising that, you know what this means? This means that one, two, three, four, five. So repent to your Lord, etc. They're told, repent. Otherwise, you know. Now that's done by, not by mob, but by court rule. Why? Because even it's, it's his own interest and family and social interest as well. How you apply that is sensitive. How you apply that is sensitive. And throughout history, there's been great sensitivity in how this is applied. And then he says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, and the repentance is for him to for the person who committed statement of disbelief to go back on what they said to go back on what they said not the mere utterance of the two testifications of faith tawbah and rejection is repentance. Rejecting false beliefs is is toba. وَإِلَّمْ يَتُبْ يَجِبُ قَتْلُهُ And then what did he say? فَيَتَأَبَّدُ فِي النَّارِ right? And if they remain after warning, after being ordered to repent, potentially after detention, then the punishment of apostasy can be applied by the Qadi upon them. And if they die in that state of apostasy, they would be in hellfire as a disbeliever. How that is applied is outside the scope of this class, but this avoids people making foolish choices that, you know, some, you know, you know as they say, God loves the common man that's why he made so many of them someone you know some charismatic preacher came by they decided to just adopt the you know that faith etc and they didn't think about the consequences etc and in families etc it can be very difficult what can the wife do what will the children do it affects inheritance it, it affects social order but how that is applied Throughout history, there have been famous cases of people who entered Islam and left, like Maimonides. And nobody tried to kill him, etc. It ultimately returns to the judgment of the Qadi. Ultimately returns to the judgment of the Qadi. Not every ruling that is, that is applicable must be applied in every scenario. Right? Because ultimately, the Qadi acts with consideration of public interest. And sometimes something may be true that this ruling should apply, but in applying it, consequences must be considered. Because the consequent harm may be far greater than just letting things slide. Then he tells us, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, the second of the harms of the tongue are the things from which disbelief is feared. It is things from which disbelief is feared. So he says, Athani min afati lisan 
ما فيه خوف الكفر things from which fear from this which disbelief is feared and these are the things that the fuqaha said that and sometimes they'll just say that such and such thing is disbelief but it's not because it's in itself disbelief but because it could entail something that is disbelief وحكمه أن يؤمر بالتوبة وتجديد النكاح احتياطا and things from which disbelief is feared that they're commanded to make tawbah and to renew their marriage out of caution now here there's a very simple distinction that the fear of disbelief we have to understand that fear itself has two types shara'an We just use a simple example. If you cross the road, is there some fear that out of nowhere, like if you, they say what, look left and then right, correct? You look left, you look right, and you look left again and you crossed. Is it possible? Is there a fear that unbeknownst to you, A car came from the direction that you didn't look at the moment of crossing and could hit you? Is it possible? Yes. But is that a reasonable fear? If you've looked on both sides? No. It's not a reasonable fear. If it was a reasonable fear, nobody would ever cross the road. If you open the door to your house, is it possible that there's someone waiting at the door with a machete to slaughter you? Is it possible? Yes. But is that a reasonable fear? Not normally. Alhamdulillah. So we don't act on mere fears. If you see a creaking sound in the house, is it possible that a mass murderer is now in your house? Yes. Is that a reasonable fear? Do you call 911 just by hearing creaking sounds? No. So the same thing applies to anything else. That there's two types of fear, which are reasonable fear and unreasonable fear. Reasonable fear is a fear that has sufficient basis. Sufficient basis. So we would say that there's not enough basis for it to be actual disbelief, but there's reasonable fear. It's a highly dubious statement. So that's where you make both tawbah and you would renew your, your marriage out of caution. It doesn't count as talaq, out of caution. If, let's say, Uncle Jamil heard, you know, Uncle Jamil's not been working. Auntie Jamila, his wife, said, John, are we doing well financially? He says, yes. So she goes and buys herself a new car, a new fridge, a new computer and she's decided to start doing uh, in Auntie Jamila's wisdom a vlog on YouTube Auntie Jamila's wisdom so she bought $15,000 of media equipment as well to make a YouTube studio in their basement then the Uncle Jamil's broke so he heard that the local church gives out handouts so he goes says to the preacher sir I heard you give handouts. Says yes, only for Christian. So he says, "Well, I'm Christian too. I love Jesus Christ." And the preacher gives him money. At any point, did he leave the faith? No. No. So, th- but that is dubious. That is dubious. So caution. If he asks, caution is called upon. But that should be done with consultation. That should be done with consultation. You don't self-diagnose this kind of dubious matter. Some of it will be said, no, that, that was foolish. Uncle Jamil, that was foolish. Because Uncle Jamil might just, you know, like, that's why you can't give yourself a fatwa in these kinds of situations. Uncle Jamil might be, you know what? Maybe I was kafir. That's why I'm get rid of this... This spendthrift woman. 
right? Or whatever. So no. So those things, those are surgery situations. You have to go to a scholar. That a, a scholar may say, Uncle J Jamil, if so, the persons of religious maturity, etc., say, look, just renew the nikah privately, not publicly. Right? And sometimes the fuqaha mention their books, different situations where you renew the nikah. That is, that is caution. That is circumstantial, and any caution is recommended. Number one, number two, only when it has positive outcomes. What is required is to repent. We are not lax about statements of disbelief, right? So, in a situation like this, what is absolutely required is that they repent. Right? If you say things that are genuinely, there's genuinely reasonable fear of disbelief, right? And as opposed to just errors in judgment. I know a family who used to go to a Hare Krishna temple because they'd serve free food. Now, would anyone think that they're disbelievers just by going to get food? Now, it is sinful. A Muslim should not go to another religion's place of worship idly. Because what's, what's worse to enter? A church, church or temple or a bar? Yeah, church or temple. Because what's worse to go to a, a nightclub or to go to a temple? Same thing. Because the sin of disbelief, the sin of polytheism is far worse than the outward sins. Now we deal with people with respect. We deal if you know if a prostitute comes out, we don't disrespect anybody. We we hate wrongdoing and sin, not the wrongdoer or the sinner. It's nothing personal. Right? We don't disrespect even any person like that, right? And they're all God's creation. But so someone just went to a temple, that is a sin. But if they said certain things, yes, we are Hare Krishna too. Astaghfirullah. So you have to repent from that. Now, if they did more than that, they should go consult a scholar. Right? Because, um, and, but merely, you know, but, so don't self-diagnose possibilities of kufr. Right? Because a lot of people say, oh, well, I watched a, a documentary about cathedrals and I thought, oh, they're so majestic and stuff. Oh, you know, no. Did at any time you stop believing in the truth of the prophetic guidance? No. Were you, you know, you have any confusion? The only cure for confusion is to ask, as the Prophet وسلم, said. Okay. Then he says, الثالثو الخطأ Errors with respect to disbelief. وَحُكْمُهُ أَنْ يُؤْمَرَ بِالتَّوْبَةِ وَالْإِسْتِغْفَارِ فَقَطْ And the ruling of errors that can entail disbelief is that the person is told to repent and seek forgiveness. And that's it. Such as they said something casually that was incorrect. So they said, um, yeah, they, they use an inappropriate expression. That they said, well, in the mind of Allah, all, all things are known. That's an error in speech. You shouldn't have said, because we know Allah, because a mind is a, is a limited thing. It's created, we don't ascribe any body parts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, etc. But... The person, it was an error in expression. So you make istighfar and remind yourself, I'm going to be more careful in what, what I speak. So you repent. And repentance, of course, entails that you re have remorse. You commit not to return to such things. And you leave that matter. So that's, so it's not disbelief. But you repent. 
you repent and if you said it in front of others you also seek you you clarify to them and you seek their forgiveness so these are the first three of the sins of speech they relate to disbelief misgivings about disbelief are rampant in our times because of loneliness people are alone and loneliness and we've talked about loneliness before as well people practice their religion on their own right w without social and communal context they learn their religion on their own without teachers without companions and they try to clarify religion on their own without consultation. And the Prophet ﷺ said, "Alaykum bil jama'ah, be with the group, wa iyyakum wal furqa, and beware of remaining alone. For the shaytan min al wahid, for the shaytan is close to one alone and is more distant even from two. Wa huwa min al ithnaini abad." So the Prophet ﷺ tells us. The hadith is in Tirmidhi and elsewhere, and it's a Sahih hadith. Man arada buhbuhat al jannah, fal yelzam al jama'ah. Whoever seeks the vast plains of paradise, or the joys of paradise, or the sweet scent of paradise, let them hold fast to the group, let them hold fast to community. This is socially, religiously, in one's religious learning. But also, when unsure, talk it through with somebody. Doesn't always have to be a scholar. Sometimes a, a friend can help. Okay. And remaining in a state of confusion or hardship on religious matters or even life matters is an unwitting turning away from divine mercy. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ Allah wants ease for you. وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمْ الْعُسْرِ And he does not want difficulty for you. So, depending on test, you have friends and or family. There is community. There are teachers. There are others to consult. So reach out. I reach out. And when it relates to matters, well, I said this, it could be kufr, etc., the default is it's from the it's waswasa from the shaitan. It's misgivings from the shaitan. Say a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Refuse to accept that. Make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and turn away. And if there are things triggering it, then don't pursue those matters. Okay? A lot of people do strange things. They decide, I know somebody who decide, I want to test the strength of my faith. They decide to read 101 arguments against Islam. I've just made that Do you know 51 arguments for Islam? No. Then what are you doing? What are you doing? And if you want to text, check if you have good health, you don't stab yourself in different parts of your body. See if, let me see if I, I heal properly. Because you're stabbing yourself. I say, okay, I'll avoid the vital organs. But what if you snipped something important? You wouldn't physically harm yourself. Don't spiritually harm yourself. I'm de reading the definitive arguing argument for atheism. Have you read any arguments for, for your belief itself? No. So that's straightforward. Likewise, they say al maasi barid al kufr. Sins are the precursors of disbelief, because the Prophet sallallahu That's from the words of one of the early Muslims. That. Faith gets worn out. Al Imanu Yabla. And how does it wear out? By the weakness of one's religious practice, either in quantitatively or qualitatively. You're still you go, you're going through the motions, but you're neglecting either the outward sunnas of those actions or you're neglecting sincerity. Yes. Actions are lifeless forms, Ibn Atta'illah says whose life-giving spirit is the secret of sincerity within them. So, sometimes if you find doubts or confusions, 
first you know you're a believer but you have to pause and identify go consult but also consult and don't delay but also reflect that what is it that's causing it and what the ulama tell us and what two decades of experience show that Allah does not is the divine promise in the Quran that Allah does not change the state of a people until they change what is within themselves what was going right before and why are things going wrong now well before I used to go to the masjid I used to attend circles of knowledge I used to have a circle of friends I used to have religious routines I used to take care of my sunnas I didn't used to have so many online uh, movie subscriptions or whatever the, what are the streaming services um, I didn't spend so much time senselessly scrolling through social media I was an, you know you watch enough images of naked people and you know it's, you're not going to have angelic thoughts you're going to have other kinds of thoughts whether you're a man or a woman like they say you are what you eat but you're also what you see your consciousness is shaped by the images that you pollute your mind with. So that's where one needs some life editing. And so one hastens to consult, but one reflects and one has to identify, okay, what is it that caused this? And you have to get rid of it. You started just watching some you know, sometimes it happens. You get on whatever, you know, did, you know, uh, service, whether it be YouTube or Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or whatever. And you watch one video, other videos arise. Let me just mindlessly click. And you know it's nonsense, but it leaves you with confusion. Now, some things you got to ignore. We've got a skunk problem. Now, if there is a skunk in the back of the house, now, would you go chase the skunk? No. Because skunks do the skunky thing. What you know, they spray. That we had a little skunk spray in the backyard last night because the dryer turned on and <laughs> got a, bit, a whiff of bad smell, but not too bad. It was, it was nice, but everything was closed. You go run after the skunk. And you'll be stinking for the rest of the week. Right? So similarly, but you can just safely ignore it. Don't open the door. So similarly, if you have doubts, you have to take, take ownership. Go consult, but also identify the causes. Right? We took this insight earlier in the text that to alaju. الأمراض في إزالة أسبابها that ailments are treated by the removal of their causes. How do you find out their causes? By knowledge, consultation, reflection, and leaving the things that lead that obviously to it, even indirectly, even indirectly. One of my friends, for example, well, acquaintance. He was, he became professor at a university overseas. Handsome man, this and that, and became professor at a young age and looked younger than his age too. And he was having issues with all these young ladies who were proposing to him and all kinds of crazy things. And he was fearing about maintaining his fidelity in marriage. So he went to a scholar and he said, are you going to lose your job if you're scruffy? He said, no. So the sheikh said, very easy solution. He said, don't, don't. He said, take care of your appearance outside the lecture hall. But when you give your lecture, don't brush. Don't, you know, said don't comb your hair, right? Wear 
Scruff your clothes. Dress up nicely elsewhere. Dress up nicely in the masjid. Dress up nicely when you go for dinner with your friends. But be scruffy there. And don't be nice to anybody. And they'll all keep away from you. He did it, but he still struggled. So the, the sheikh told him that, look, what matters more to you? Your marriage or your job? Say, my marriage. Say, then you can look for another job. And he, Hamza, he's a humble guy. He took a research position, stopped lecturing for a little while till he could address his, his faith. Similarly, there are situations where one may be in a line of academic study or research or other areas where what you're studying is challenging your faith. Sometimes It doesn't mean that you give up, but sometimes you, one should have the courage to step away. One should have the courage to step away. Realize you, said, you like philosophy, you've not studied any is, Islamic theology. You haven't studied Islamic metaphysics. You, haven't, you don't know our notion of reality. So what do you do? You may need to step away. To equip yourself, to engage in this area, equipped. If you find yourself, if you wake up in the middle of the battlefield, do you join the battle? No, you got to go look for a weapon first. Otherwise, they're going to kill you. Simple. You, you decide to go camping. You didn't he see the signs that there's a war between the Banu Bilal and Banu Jamil. Two families. You went to sleep. You woke up in the middle of battle. Say, oh, I hate Banu Bilal. I'm with Banu Jamil. Yeah, that's nice, but go get a weapon. Right? And what's the weapon? It's, it's knowledge. Knowledge and strength of faith. So many things require that. That if we find ourselves in a situation of harm, you got to get out of the situation of harm. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we'll continue from there. The next two lessons we'll be looking at a very critical day-to-day -day challenge, which is lying. And the harms of lying. And the gravest of lying, which is falsehood and false testimony, lying against Allah and His Messenger, careless transmission of hadith. Also, to look at what is, mis what is to give a misimpression. And there's a number of blameworthy traits of speech related to lying. So the first three blameworthy traits of speech related to, or sinful types of speech, relate to disbelief. Actual statements of belief, Statements that would cause one would cause there to be objective, reasonable fear of disbelief. And thirdly, errors in speaking related to disbelief. Um, neither number two nor number three are kufr themselves. And we emphasize the issue of ignoring doubts, but also treating the causes of doubts. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Any questions before we close? We have, of course, on the Seeker's Guide and Science Service, many resources about doubts and misgivings in general. We have a reader on it, etc. For those who sometimes have an active mind and have questions about their about belief and why I believe, etc. Alhamdulillah, we have many courses on seekers, both full structured courses, but also on-demand courses on what we believe, why we believe, uh, why belief in Allah, etc. Those are things to always connect and reconnect with. And beware of being alone in these kinds of situations as well. And don't hesitate to be of those who consult because consultation is strength it's not weakness walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin